welcome to today's Steris Tech Talk on Radiation Sterilization Validation Approach, a Microbiological Perspective. Steris Tech Talks are a series of webinars covering subjects relating to gas and radiation sterilization processing and the laboratory testing and validation services which support these processes. My name is Ashley Maru, and I'm the Associate Product Manager for Steris Applied Sterilization Technologies. I'll be the host for today's event. Our presenter today is Jason Rogers. Jason is a principal scientist for Steris AST, representing Steris on several AMI committees, including microbial methods and sterility assurance. He graduated from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a bachelor's degree in biology. Jason has 15 years of experience in the medical device industry and contract laboratory testing services. All attendees are on mute for the presentation. However, we would like to encourage everyone to submit questions using the questions function on the GoToWebinar control panel. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Today's presentation will be recorded and uploaded to our Steris Applied Sterilization Technologies YouTube channel. Please note that continuing education credits are not provided as part of this webinar. And now over to Jason to begin the presentation. Thank you, Ashley, and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's Laboratory Tech Talk on Radiation Sterilization Validation Approach, a Microbiological Perspective. I am Jason Rogers, Principal Scientist with Steris Applied Sterilization Technologies. In today's webinar, we will define some key terms outline the applicable standards, discuss the four microbiological phases of the sterilization validation, and touch on routine dose audits. First, let's review some key terms that will come up throughout the webinar. Colony forming units are our microbiological unit of measure. In theory, during incubation, a single cell replicates on growth media to give rise to a visible colony. These colonies can be counted to give an estimate of the viable contamination on a sample. This estimated number of colony forming units on a device is then referred to as the device bioburden. Bioburden is the population of viable microorganisms on or in a product and or sterile barrier system. Bacteriostasis fungistasis is the test that is used to ensure that sterility test the sterility test method is not inhibited by the presence of the device, leading to a potentially false, false negative or no growth result. The test of sterility as defined by ISO is the technical operation performed as part of the development, validation, or requalification to determine the presence or absence of viable microorganisms on product or portions thereof after exposure to the sterilizing agent. It is a qualitative test. Tests of sterility is performed at a lower verification dose than the routine sterilization dose. This dose is selected based on the bio burden of the device to yield a certain sterility assurance level. The sterility assurance level is the probability of a non-sterile device after exposure to the sterilant. In the case of VDMAX, the, sterilization, the sterility assurance level at which we would perform the test of sterility would be 10 to the minus one, or a probability of one in 10 of a non-sterile device. In method one and method two sterilization validations, the test of sterility is performed at a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus two, or a probability of two in 100 of a non-sterile device. This lower dose at which we perform the test of sterility is referred to as the verification dose. Now let's outline the standards that we will use to perform the radiation sterilization validations. The ISO 11137-2 standard guides us with the process used to validate the sterilization of a device. For method one, method two, VDMAX 15, and VDMAX 25. 
ISO 13004 outlines additional VDMAX dose options from 17.5 kg up to 35 kg. For the microbial testing carried out in the radiation sterilization validation, we refer to the ISO 11737-1 standard, which covers bioburden testing, including the testing for adverse substances and bioburden recovery efficiency. It also gives guidance for product families for bioburden testing and data use and trending. ISO 11737-2 provides information on sterility testing, including the sterility method suitability or bacteriostasis fungistasis, which is used to validate the sterility testing method. The microbial testing performed for radiation sterilization validation occurs as four phases. Phase one is the test method validations. Under this phase, the method to be employed during the bioburden testing and sterility testing portions of the process are validated to ensure that results obtained are accurate. The devices are often irradiated so that the product's natural bioburden does not contaminate the test method validations. These test method validation samples can be irradiated with the high dose samples used for functionality testing as a cost saving option. Amy TIR 17 can also be useful in determining material compatibility with radiation modalities. Phase two is the enumeration and characterization of bioburden. Here, the number and type of organisms present on the product prior to exposure to irradiation is determined, and this information is used to carry out the next phase of the radiation sterilization validation, which is the determination or calculation of verification dose. The overall bioburden average is used to determine the irradiation dose that will be applied to the product at the low dose or the verification dose. <clears throat> this verification dose is expected to yield a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus one for VD max or 10 to the minus two for method one. The dose is selected from tables within ISO 11137-2 or ISO 13004 standards using the bioburden average value. Note that for method two, Low but incremental doses are applied to the product with subsequent tests of sterility. Based on the outcome of the tests of sterility, the verification dose is calculated and a specific lot or batch may be required to be used. In phase four, verification dose experiment, we expose the product to the determined dose range and subsequently perform tests of sterility. We can now look at these four steps or four phases in more depth. Phase one of the microbiological radiation sterilization validation is where we perform the test method validations. Test method validations are an important part of the radiation val sterilization validation as they ensure that results we obtain are accurate and appropriate. Test method validations are required by the standards and are expected during device review and audits by regulatory and notified bodies. The method validations must be reviewed regularly to determine if they are still applicable. In this regular review of the device, device's method validations, manufacturers should assess whether changes in the material or construction of the device could affect the validity of the test method. Similarly, do changes in suppliers or vendors, changes in the device design, or how the device is cleaned, including changes in cleaning solutions, impact the existing test method validations. Additionally, changes to the manufacturing, equipment, environment, and processes should also be assessed. Even in the absence of significant changes, a scheduled periodic review of the need to revalidate should be part of the quality system. This review is to ensure the accumulation of minor changes has not occurred over time. Now that we have discussed the test method validations in general terms, let's 
discuss bioburden test method validations. There are two parts under bioburden test method validation processing. The first is bioburden recovery, which is the test validating the removal and culturing of organisms from the product. In addition to the bioburden recovery, we also should consider the need for adverse or inhibiting substance testing. This test validates the neutralization of substances that may be inhibitory or lethal to microbes during the extraction process. Screening for inhibitory substances <clears throat> is important to ensuring that measurement of contamination on a device is not impeded or impacted by substances present in the test. Note <clears throat> that adverse substance testing may not always be applicable, but should always be considered. Looking closer at the bioburden recovery validation process, the bioburden recovery efficiency is important for ensuring an accurate measurement of contamination on a device from the manufacturing and packaging process. A bioburden recovery validation is used to determine a correction factor, which will be applied to routine bioburden raw data to adjust values compensating for incomplete removal of microorganisms from extraction. These adjusted bioburden values obtained during the sterilization validation are used to determine an appropriate dose for the verification dose experiment and ultimately ensure the product will receive 10 to the minus six sterility assurance level in the routine sterilization dose. Hence the importance the data, that data from this test method is accurate. Two types <clears throat> or options of bioburden recovery efficiency testing are inoculated method, which is often referred to as direct inoculation method, this uses an artificial bioburden spiked onto the product. The efficiency is measured by the sample recovery against the inoculum population. Native repetitive method, often referred to as exhaustive recovery method, uses the product's natural bioburden. Efficiency is measured in this method by the first extraction against the total from all repetitive extractions. To understand the inoculated bioburden recovery method better, let's look at a working example. The first step in the process is to inoculate the product with an artificial spike of a known inoculum level, approximately 100 bacillus spores, and allow this spike to dry. Next, the product is immersed in the extraction fluid and, the extraction, and an extraction process is completed. In this example, sonication followed by shaking was used. The extraction fluid is then filtered or pore plated to determine the number of CFU present in the extraction fluid that have been recovered or removed from the product. The CFU value is compared to the inoculum population to calculate the correction factor. In this example, the inoculum population was 125. CFU and the CFU recovered in one rinse of the product was 105. The single rinse recovery efficiency was calculated by dividing 105 by 125, equaling 84%. Therefore, the calculated correction factor was the inverse or 1 divided by 0 0.84, which equals 1.2. If the CFU count on a filter in a routine test was 80 CFU, then the bioburden result would be 80 times 1.2, giving us a calculated CFU count of 96 CFU. A quick overview of the bioburden inoculation method is that it has a known starting population, therefore has a consistent point of reference to use for calculation of the correction factor. It is typically used for products with low, bio, low levels of natural bioburden. It tests the recovery of only one species of bacteria, which was inoculated onto the device. And since it requires an artificial means of contamination, it may not be inoculated in exactly the same manner or locations of the product's natural contamination during the manufacturing process. 
it, it can be used for products that are not suitable for repetitive wash process method, such as products that dissolve or those that are suspended, such as powders or gels. Now let's look at a working example for the repetitive bioburden recovery method to understand that process better. For this method, the product the product's own natural bioburden contamination is used, therefore no artificial spike is required. The first step is to immerse the product in the extraction fluid and complete the extraction process. In this example, sonication followed by sonic followed by shaking was used. The extraction fluid is then filtered or pore plated to determine the number of CFU present in the extraction fluid that have been recovered or removed from the product. This is referred to as the first rinse. The product is then immersed in new extraction fluid and the extraction and assaying processes are completed again. This rinsing and testing process is completed a number of times. In the case of, in the case of this example, four rinses in total were completed. The CFU value from the first rinse is compared to the cumulative value obtained for all rinses to calculate the correction factor. In this example, the first rinse value was 130 CFU, the second was 35 CFU, the third was 10 CFU, and the fourth was 1 CFU, giving a total value for all rinses of 176 CFU. The first rinse recovery efficiency was calculated by dividing 130 by 176 giving us 74% efficiency. Therefore, the calculated correction factor is 1.4. Again, if a count on a routine test was 80 CFU, then the bioburden result would be corrected by multiplying 80 times 1.4 for a calculated bioburden value of 112. A quick overview of the bioburden repetitive method is that it does not have a known starting population and involves multiple rinses of the product. It is typically used for products with consistent high levels of natural bioburden. If the product has low natural bioburden levels or there are large variances in bioburden levels, the results may be invalid for Due to the repeated rinsing process, this method is not suitable for product types which dissolve or are suspended, such as powders or gels. We have looked at the test method validation for bioburden recovery. Now let's look at the test method validation process for adverse substance screening. So let's first discuss where inhibitory substances may come from. They may be substances present on or in the product to impart antimicrobial properties as part of the device design. Examples of this would be antibiotics, coatings, wound dressings impregnated with silver or other metals. In these cases, the presence of the substances are known by the device design team or manufacturer prior to sending the samples to the test lab and test method development. Upfront notif notification of, or of information on known adverse substances will allow the test lab to carry out trial work and build neutralization into the proposed test method in advance of beginning the test method validations. Sharing this information with the test lab along with safety data sheets will ensure that Appropriate safety and disposal processes are considered as part of initial product and method review. There may be adverse substances present on or in a product that unintentionally cause inhibition in the test method. Examples of this may also be product coatings or residual detergents from cleaning processes. Typically, the presence of these substances or their impact is unknown by the manufacturer or the test lab prior to the test method development and is only discovered during the first phase of testing. They are often more difficult to overcome as they cause the inhibition, as the cause of the inhibition may not be obvious 
and trial work may need may be required to develop a solution. These unknown adverse substances are more likely to cause delays to project timelines as it is an unexpected issue. Under the test method validation process, there are two adverse screening adverse substance screening tests, the bioburden adverse substance screening, which verifies the bioburden test method suitability. This involves neutralization for a quantitative test or a number of colony forming units. The other is the bacteriostasis fungistasis test or BNF test, which verifies the sterility test method suitability. This involves neutralization for a qualitative test or presence or absence of growth. Both tests require sterile products and use low levels of specified test organisms, 10 to 100 CFU, to inoculate the test vessels. Note that the presence of adverse substances can cause additional testing costs, additional costs may be, additional products may be required and additional time delays to the overall project. Therefore, it is recommended to perform feasibility testing as early as possible in the project, as multiple attempts may need to be performed to obtain a successful outcome. So when we look at adverse screening for bioburden test method, this test ensures that the presence of the product does not adversely impact microorganisms in extraction and thus create false, a falsely low measurement of contamination on the device. Under the bioburden bio adverse screening products should be subjected to the same extraction technique planned for routine testing and validated during bioburden recovery method validation. The required outcome in the bioburden adverse screening test is that the quantity of growth or number of CFU recovered from the samples containing product is not significantly different to that seen from samples containing no product or our positive controls. There are several techniques which can be employed to overcome adverse substance issues in the bioburden test, such as filtration, dilution, or inactivation or removal of the inhibitory substance by the addition of a neutralizing substance. Now let's look at the bacteriostasis fungistasis test, sometimes also referred to as sterility test method suitability. This test determines whether the presence of the product has a potential deleterious effect on the ability of organisms to grow in the sterility test. Therefore, this test ensures that the product does not create a false negative or no growth result. The BNF test requires a minimum of three organisms per media type, and growth must be observed within five days of incubation. Under the bacteriostasis fungistasis test, products should be subjected to the same proposed method planned for the sterility testing. The required outcome in the BNF test is that growth in the test containers with product is equivalent to that seen with test containers that have no product or are positive controls. Again, there are a number of techniques which can be employed to overcome adverse substance issues in the BNF test, such as filtration, dilution, or inactivation or removal of the inhibitory substance by the addition of a neutralizing substance. As this is a quantitative test, we are look, or a qualitative test, we are looking for growth of the inoculated organisms in the product test containers versus growth seen in the positive controls. Here you see some growth in tubes of the um, compendial organisms used for the BNF test. Now let's discuss the second microbiological phase in the radiation sterilization validation, the enumeration and characterization of bioburden. The determination of the number and types of microorganisms present on a product are the most critical components of the radiation validation process. The number of microbes is used to determine the verification dose to be applied to the product, and the types of microbes affect the potential resistance to radiation 
impacting the success of a verification dose experiment. Understanding the number and types of microbes are also important factors in the grouping of products into product families, the inclusion of a product into an existing family, or the selection of a product to represent a product family. Bioburden is the key to the radiation validation process in determining the number and types of microbes present on a device. With this information, we are trying to understand the challenge to the sterilization process. Bioburden testing is performed according to guidance in ISO 11737-1. It is a quantitative test, so we will have a specific number of organisms as a result, which is reported as colony-forming units. The bioburden test process involves four main steps. Product preparation, which is the cutting or dismantling of a device and placing those parts for testing in a test vessel with extraction fluid. Next is the extraction, which is the process of agitation of the device in the presence of the extraction fluid to remove microbial contamination from the device. This may involve either sonication, mechanical shaking, or stomaching, or a combination of these processes. Third, we have filtration or plating of the extract. Filtration of the extraction fluid can be passed through a 0.45 micron filter, trapping organisms present in the extraction fluid on the surface of the filter paper. Filter paper is then placed on an auger media plate. Note that for items that cannot be filtered, pour plate method is an option and is performed by mixing the extraction fluid with tempered auger and allowing it to solidify. Enumeration is the next step. After the auger plates are incubated under the required incubation conditions for the appropriate period of time, CFUs present on the plate after incubation are counted to give a raw, a raw bioburden value. A point to consider when developing the production process is to carry out bioburden testing and identification testing. This will help to build a history on the product regarding bioburden levels and microbial types present. And this knowledge can then help in the determination of the appropriate approach for the sterilization validation of the product. For example, if a product has average values of less than 1000 CFU, you could possibly use VDMAX 25. However, if a product has average values of between 3000 and 4000 CFU, then VDMAX 27.5 may be a more appropriate approach. Additionally, having historical bioburden data assists in determining methods to improve the necessary detection level in the bioburden test for optimizing the radiation sterilization validation approach. For example, if there is a history of low bioburden on the product, the detection level may need to be increased. This can be done by reducing the parameters being tested or by using dual incubation of the culture plates to reduce pollution factors. For example, incubating plates at 30 to 35C for aerobic organisms and then re-incubating the same plates at 20 to 25C for fungi. Additionally, pooling of products could be performed to increase sensitivity. However, this process will not show sample to sample variation and could mask elevated individual sample results. Additionally, a sample item portion cannot be used when, uh, or pooling cannot be used when a sample item portion is used. Some additional points on bioburden testing. It should be carried out <clears throat> on product that has undergone the full packaging process. Therefore, the articles under test in the dose determination process are reflective of the routine devices manufacturing and the contamination that may be present for the routine sterilization process. If the device configuration requires that only a sample item portion can be tested, that is only a portion or part of the product can be tested, 
then this SIP must be accounted for in subsequent calculations or determinations for dose. Characterization of the CFU present on the device form an important piece of the information generated in the radiation sterilization validation process. The identification of the organisms can assist in understanding the potential challenge to sterilization dose in grouping products into families or with the selection of a master product. Microbial characterization is also useful during investigation of exceeded bioburden limits or sterility positives. Most basic, the most basic form of identification is colony morphology. It gives us visual description of the, of the colony's growth characteristics such as color, shape, consistency, and how the edge of the colony looks. For example, the organism in the bottom left picture is cream, wrinkled, dry, with an irregular edge. This visual description helps to classify observed phenotypes over time. When coupled with further identification processes can give insights into the possible genus or species recovered. However, descriptions of the colony appearance are open to interpretation and are often not a particularly confident method of identification. Gram staining gives <clears throat> of the colony gives further clues to the organism's identification. The gram stain tells us about the cell wall of the bacteria recovered. When viewed under a microscope, gram-positive organisms appear purple from the primary stain in the staining process due to its thick peptidoglycan layer. Gram-negative organisms appear red from the secondary stain in the staining process as the Primary stain is easily washed away because of a thin peptidoglycan layer and lipopolysaccharide layer. To obtain a more specific, higher confidence level match, MALDI-TOF identification can be completed. MALDI-TOF stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. This is based on a ribosomal protein, anal based on ribosomal proteins analyzed by mass spectrometry. A smear of the organism is placed on a target plate and then overlaid with a test matrix solution. And then the target is placed into the Maldi-Tough instrument. The plate is then electrified and subsequently uh, blasted with a laser to separate the proteins which travel up a vacuum and are measured by a detector. Each microorganism's protein type and quantity ratio provide a spectra or similar to a fingerprint for that microorganism. The spectra is then compared against a library of other organism spectra to achieve an identification. Now let's discuss phase three of the microbiological radiation validation, the determination or calculation of the verification dose. In a full triple batch validation or three batch validation, the verification dose is set using the overall average bio burden. However, if any single batch has, if any single batch of those three lots has an average bio burden twice or more the average of the total overall average than the single batch average, otherwise known as the highest batch average, would be used for dose setting. We then look up the bioburden average in the corresponding table in ISO 11137-2 for the corresponding verification dose. We use table five for method one and table nine for BDMAX 25. Note that there are additional tables in this, in this standard and in ISO 13004 for other VDMAX methods. Method 2A and method 2B 
as well as mo modified method 2A and 2B are typically used when low doses are desired. These types of validations are becoming more and more rare due to the number of samples required and the availability of additional VMAX options. With the method two validations, determination of dose is based on several calculations from tests of sterility of 20 samples at each incremental dose. The difference relates to the number of incremental doses and what those doses are. For example, method 2A has a series of at least nine doses, starting at 2 kg and increasing in nominal increments of 2 kg. This test requires 500, a minimum of 540 samples. Method 2B has a series of at least eight doses, starting at 1 kg and increasing in nominal increments of 1 kg, uh, requiring a minimum of 480 samples. After the verification dose is complete for method two validations, an additional calculation is performed for the 10 to the minus six sterilization dose that will be used routinely for the product. Modified method 2A and modified method 2B are in Amy TIR 40 and involve smaller series of incremental doses. Based on the number of positives in each incremental dose, a verification dose is calculated and a specific batch is selected for use in the verification dose study. 100 samples are then irradiated at the verification dose and subsequently tested for sterility, possibly requiring a specific batch to be used. The method two validations require significantly increased sample quantities irradiation costs, testing costs, and time frame to complete the project. And finally, let's look at phase four, the verification dose experiment. For the verification dose experiment, we submit samples for irradiation at the designated verification dose range. For method one and method two, the standard requires 100 samples, and for VDMAX, 10 samples are required. The verification dose determined has a plus or minus 10% range. If the verification dose applied to the product is greater than the 10%, the verification dose experiment has to be repeated. If the verification dose applied to the product is less than 90% of the verification dose, uh, the verification dose experiment may be repeated. However, <clears throat> the standard allows for the dose being below 90% value, and if the completion of the test of sterility, an acceptable result is obtained, then the verification dose experiment does not need to be repeated. The test of sterility is performed on the samples that were submitted for irradiation at the designated verification dose range. There are three methods of sterility testing. Immersion, which is a direct transfer of the product, uh, which is a direct transfer and incubation of the product into liquid growth media for 14 days. This is the preferred method by the standard. Extraction is an additional method, which is the washing of the product followed by the filtration of the rinse fluid with subsequent immersion of the filter uh, in liquid growth media incubated for 14 days. Note that if you are utilizing the extraction method, the recovery efficiency and a risk assessment must be performed to assess the potential risk of not detecting surviving organisms by utilizing an indirect method of culturing. Filtration is the third method and that is the filtering of the of liquid samples through the through a filter with subsequent immersion and incubation of the filter in a liquid growth media for 14 days. Sterility testing is performed according to the guidance in ISO 11737-2. Whenever possible, we want to irradiate the product in its original form and packaging. 
However, some large and or complex products may require extensive manipulation during the sterility testing process. To reduce the possibility of laboratory contamination or false positives in carrying out tests of sterility, the product may be disassembled or cut up and repackaged prior to the irradiation step. These manipulations prior to irradiation would not be acceptable if, the chain, if, if they change the magnitude of the bioburden or its response to radiation. After substantiation of the sterilization dose has been completed, the ISO 11137-2 and 13004 standards outline the requirement to carry out periodic dose audits to confirm the established sterilization dose is still applicable. Dose audits are typically performed quarterly when the product is produced. Ten samples are tested per bioburden regardless of validation type. VDMAX method 1, method 2A, or 2B. The frequency of bioburden testing may vary depending on the validation type. Samples are also tested for sterility after exposure to the verification dose determined during the radiation sterilization validation. For VDMAX, 10 samples would be required. For method 1, 100 samples. And for method 2A or 2B, also 100 samples. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. This concludes the webinar.